Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to this info day dedicated to the call from Connecting Europe Facility Energy Program dedicated to cross-border renewable preparatory studies. Thanks for joining. We are here live from Brussels. Uh, we have an intense program this morning uh, divided into two parts. And after that, you will be able to get all the relevant information if you are interested to apply to this call. In the first part of the info day, we are going to touch upon the policy context and the priorities of the CEF Energy Multiannual Work Program, as well as information on evaluation and award criteria. Um, this, these presentations will be given by colleagues uh, of, from uh, Director General for Energy, as well as from, uh, from CINEA. Um, you will have a possibility to ask uh, questions uh, and, um, uh, for this first part at around 11 o'clock. We, um, we will reply to all the questions which we have received. Uh, the second part of, uh, of the info day will be dedicated to very practical information on how to prepare a successful proposal, on how to deal with budget management in proposals. You will also get a, a demonstration on how to submit a proposal and how the participant portal works. And you will also hear about the legal provisions from uh, our CEF model grant agreement in case you are selected for funding. Also, the second part of the info day will be closed by uh, a Q&A uh, session. So we aim to conclude by one o'clock. Uh, important information, we use uh, Slido to collect uh, uh, your questions. So you see in the agenda, in the, in the cover, uh, now the, the hashtag CEF Energy CBRS. So please uh, put your questions there. And uh, without further ado, I would like first of all to introduce uh, um, our executive director of CINEA, Mr. Dirk Beckers, who will give uh, a short introduction and a welcome. Dirk, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Thank you, Beatrice. And ladies and gentlemen, good morning from my side too. So as Beatrice said, I'm uh, Dirk Beckers, I'm the director of the European Climate Infrastructure and Environment Executive Agency, CINEA which is managing a number of EU funding programs on behalf of the European Commission and this in support of the European Green Deal objectives. I must say I'm very happy to address you today as part of the Info Day on preparatory studies for cross-border renewable energy projects in the framework of the new Connecting Europe Facility Energy Program 21-27, which entered into force in July 21. Next slide, please. To start with, let me give you a bit of information on CINEA. It was established on, uh, in April 2021 with the launch of the new uh, MFF and as a continuation of the management of some programs that were previously managed by two other agencies, which was INEA and then the ESME. Uh, we are, but as you can see as well, we are managing a budget of more than 58 billion euros during this uh, period and we will be a bit more than 500 staff uh, up to 2027. Now we are at the moment, just to give you an idea of what, uh, the, uh, what we are managing, we have at the moment around 3,000 projects and uh, in the years to come we expect to go to uh, around 4,500 projects to be managed. Now the added value of the agency is on different fields, uh, like we are promoting the funding and provide green advisory service to potential beneficiaries. Uh, we engage directly with all of you, with beneficiaries and stakeholders by providing support all along the project life cycle. We raise the visibility of program results. Uh, we provide feedback, of course, to the European Commission on, on the execution of the programs uh, so that it can be taken into account in the, uh, in the next uh, uh, calls. And then we are exploring as well areas for harmonization and synergies between the different programs that we are managing. Next slide, please. Now, as you can see on the screen, where uh, CINIA is responsible for uh, quite some uh, programs, so seven in total, which are most of them or all of them are focused on uh, delivering the Green Deal objectives. Um, we have the Horizon Europe Cluster 5, climate, energy and uh, mobility part. We are managing the Innovation Fund, which is a program that funds innovative low carbon technologies uh, to be applied in renewables as well. And the LIFE program, 
the European Maritime Fisheries and Aquaculture Fund, uh, the Renewable Energy Financing Mechanism, of course, uh, the Just Transition Mechanism for Public Sector and Loan Facility, and then, of course, as well, the uh, Connect Europe Facility 2 program, so 21-27, of which we are managing the uh, energy and the transport part, whereas the uh, the digital part is uh, managed by, by another agency. Now, CEF supports, as you know for sure, supports infrastructure and connectivity in Europe across the three sectors. I mentioned them just before, transport, energy and digital. And for the funding period 21-27 now, a new category of eligible projects is available under CEF Energy, the cross-border projects in the field of renewable energy, which we call the REST projects. Now, today's info day will cover the priorities of the 2022 call for preparatory studies for cross-border renewable projects, which opened on the 20th of September and will close on the 10th of January 2023. Next slide, please. As you can see on this screen, uh, the new total financial envelope for CEF, uh, for the CEF program uh, is uh, 33.71 billion which is split over the three sectors as follows. Uh, on transport, it's 25.81 billion euros, energy 5.84, and digital 2.07. So as I already mentioned, uh, we are managing in uh, Senia the first two parts, so the transport and energy part and uh, the digital part is uh, dealt with by the, um, the health and digital executive agency. Uh, next slide, please. Now, let me now focus, uh, which is, of course, of your main interest, which is on SEV Energy. Now, the, the, the funding under SEV Energy aims to transform the European energy infrastructure into a more resilient, greener, digital and cross-border interoperational network. Uh, it supports, of course, the transition to clean energy in the European Union. Now, the first call for proposals for PCIs was concluded with the selection of five actions for around 1 billion euros. And the second call, which was launched in 22, is currently in the evaluation phase. Now, as mentioned before, uh, a new category of eligible projects is now available for funding under SEV Energy, uh, the rest or cross-border projects in the field of renewable energy. Now, this new category responds to a renewed focus on regional and cross-border cooperation in the deployment of renewable energy in Europe as part of the clean energy package. Moreover, the support for renewables under SEF Energy has to be seen in the context of the increased climate targets and increased ambitions in renewables following the Fit for, Fit for 55 proposal and more recently with the Repower EU. Now, more details on the policy context of the cross-border renewable energy projects will be provided by my colleagues from DGNR later on. Now, for the new window on cross-border projects in the field of renewable energy, uh, Senior has already carried out the first call for proposals for preparatory studies in 2021. Two projects were selected with a total of uh, 300 million euros. Oh, sorry, of, of 300,000 euros. Uh, both projects have recently signed their grant agreement, and the teams covered by the two projects are hybrid offshore wind and cross border district heating. Uh, furthermore, for the first cross border renewable energy status call, Three projects have been recently selected and acquired the CBRS status. Uh, the first one is a hybrid offshore wind park between Estonia and Latvia. Then we have a cross-border district heating grid based on rest between Germany and Poland. And then the third one is a project to produce renewable electricity in Italy, Spain and Germany for conversion, transport and the use of green hydrogen in the Netherlands and Germany. Now, these three projects will be able to apply for studies and works in future CEF CB REST calls. Uh, and the call for studies and works is expected to be launched in November, but uh, the exact date still needs to be uh, determined. Uh, next slide, please. Now, Senia will implement a budget for the new window of the cross border renewable energy project in order to promote cross border cooperation between member states in the field of planning development and cost-effective exploitation of renewable energy sources and EU target achievement. Furthermore, to facilitate the integration of renewables through energy storage and conversion facilities and to contribute to the strategic uptake of innovative renewable technologies and to the EU's long-term decarbonisation strategy. Now, the earmarked funding under SEV Energy for this new category of projects is 15% 
of the total safe energy budget, which corresponds to around 875 million euros, of course, subject to market uptake. Next slide, please. Now let me now focus on the 2022 call for preparatory studies. This call makes available 1 million euros to support projects prior to becoming a cross-border project in the field of renewable energy and being included in the union list. The funding aims to help both EU member states and private project promoters to advance cooperation IDs, create momentum amongst involved stakeholders, and to generate a pipeline of cross-border renewable projects. As of November, Senior will also manage the calls and implementation of technical studies and works for projects which are included in the list of cross-border renewable energy projects. The three projects that I mentioned before, which were selected in the first CBRS, will then be able to apply for funding for technical studies and works. The process for preparation and adoption of the list of cross-border renewable energy projects is managed by DGNR and Senior. And senior. A new CBRS status call will be launched as well in the first quarter of 2023. Next slide, please. Uh, before I give the floor to my colleagues, uh, yes, before I give the floor to my colleagues uh, in DGNR and uh, as well colleagues from CINEA, please note that if you want to know more about CINEA, uh, you can find a lot and about the calls that we're launching. Uh, you can find a lot on our social channels and website that, that you can see now on the screen. And of course, you can always contact my colleagues and myself uh, for further information if needed. So on this basis, I would like to wish you all a very nice info day. I hope you will learn a lot and you'll get some good information, which will allow you to prepare very good applications. Now, Sinia and myself, we're really looking forward uh, to support you with this. Many thanks. And uh, I will now pass the floor, I think, to Lukas Polinski, uh, head of Unit C1, uh, Renewables and Energy System Integration Policy in DGNR. And, so over to you, uh, Lucas, and uh, many thanks to all of you for our attention and enjoy the info day. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, so now I give the floor to Vasil Stoinov, uh, legal officer in the Renewables and Energy System Integration Unit in uh, Directorate General for Energy to describe the policy context of cross-border renewable energy projects following by the priorities of the CEF Energy Multiannual World Program. Thank you, Vasil. The floor is yours. Good morning, uh, Beatrice. Good morning, colleagues. I just got a notification that Lucas will connect online in one minute. So if we uh, if we can just keep uh, for a second, I will make sure that uh, he connects and he will appear on the screen in just uh, one minute.
Yeah. While we wait uh, just uh, for, for a second for our colleagues from DGNR to, to connect, I would just like to remind uh, about uh, the Slido uh, Q&A. So uh, you can put your questions with the Slido.com with the hashtag CEFEnergyCBRS. So we look forward to receiving your questions. Thank you very much for your patience. Dear, uh, good morning, it's Hukash. I'm already in. Okay, Lukas, please start. Good morning. Good morning, everyone. Um, I have a short presentation for you about the policy context of cross-border renewable energy projects. Um, next slide, please. There has been a lot happening in our policy over, over the last months. Um, we have uh, adopted uh, many proposals for the revision of the climate and energy framework. Uh, and there are, in fact, two, uh, two large goals, in a sense, objectives that are driving our, our policy. There is the Green Deal objective uh, with... Uh, Sorry, with uh, um, with a long-term uh, goal of uh, climate neutral Europe by 2050, uh, as well as with uh, uh, ambitious objectives, ambitious targets for 2030, on the climate side, 55% greenhouse gas reduction. But uh, there were also increases of the targets for renewables and energy efficiency. So that's the if you like, mid-term to long-term agenda that is driving our policy. But to this, um, this year, there was an urgency added, the urgency stemming from the aggression of Russia on Ukraine and all the ramifications for the, for the energy system related to it. Uh, and, um, and there, uh, we responded by a number of initiatives one of them in May uh, being called Repower EU Plan, in the context of which we decided to do two things. One, to increase the target for renewables for 2030, because clearly in order to replace Russian gas, we need to deploy renewables more massively, but we need to deploy them also more urgently so we front load we want to front load these investments in renewables and therefore we also came came up with a proposal related to shortening acceleration of permit granting procedures for renewables next slide please and here you see the whole um, the whole uh, target framework if you like uh, compared uh, co between 2030 and 2020, you will see that the difference in terms of ambition is rather huge. So within a decade, we not only want that the EU cuts uh, its emissions uh, very rapidly, but we also want to, to increase the renewable share from the target of 20, in 2020, in fact, we overachieved it. We, we had around 22% in the EU. We want to go up to 45%. This means that we plan tripling of the pace of deployment of renewables. Uh, and if you look at the sectors where renewables deploy, the power sector, the buildings, industry, or transport, there have been a few sectors where the deployment was so far rather slow, particularly in transport and in, in buildings. We have seen it in transport and in buildings. And there we absolutely need to accelerate the, the deployment even more than, than elsewhere. And therefore, in our proposal for the Renewable Energy Directive, we put particular focus on the sectoral targets, the sectoral measures uh, in this regard. Next, please.
the ambition the increased ambition obviously needs to be delivered and i already mentioned that um, that for uh, the 45 percent to to happen we need to accelerate and front load the projects we need to see more massive renewables deployment if you think about it to achieve 45 percent in 2030 we need over 1200 uh, uh, over 1200 uh, uh, um, gigawatts of the uh, of the energy uh, deployed in the eu uh, and this um, this is uh, a lot and this is something that uh, that would require quicker permitting but and, and we know that this this needs to be delivered mainly by the private operators but we also would like to we see the need to continue financing of these projects and there are a number of european sources for the funding of renewables uh, in the current uh, multi-annual framework the cohesion policy continues to fund uh, renewables there is the new invest eu fund which provides guarantees to the projects you have horizon europe for more innovative projects together with the innovation fund you have life fund mainly for for studies you have the modernization fund for those member states with the highest needs for uh, for the fuel switch in their energy system uh, you have the recovery and resilience facility uh, which is which is one of the new kids on the block uh, with high financing both by grants and by by loans and then you have the connecting europe facility cross-border renewable projects which we have started in this in this perspective next please And then a few words on the objectives of, of this last but not least of, of the funding. The overall objective is the promotion of cooperation between the member states and in some cases third countries based on mechanisms uh, in, foreseen in the, uh, in the Renewable Energy Directive. Um, in this context these these projects should help member states uh, to achieve the eu target for renewables that i was that i uh, described by providing more cost effective options in parallel to their national measures to uh, for support for renewables we know that sometimes the potential for renewables is where cross border cooperation uh, is suitable rather than you know where purely domestic projects are suitable and we would like to help with this tool to reap this potential fully and this um, this tool should also facilitate renewables integration uh, in the energy system and should contribute to the uptake of innovative renewable energy technologies finally obviously uh, whatever we do with the renewable projects that contributes to to the achievement of the climate targets of the eu and therefore you have you have this also reflected here as the contribution to the eu's long-term decarbonization strategy as the way to climate neutrality leads through these higher targets uh, in 2030 and i would stop here thank you very much floor back to you Bea. Thank you very much, uh, Lukas, for, very, for this uh, very concise and very interesting presentation on the policy context of uh, renewable energy policy. Um, I now give the floor to Vasil Stonov, uh, who will uh, uh, help us to go through the priorities for the CEF Energy Multiannual Work Program and the priorities of the uh, cross-border preparatory studies call, so this call. Thank you very much. Uh, Vasil, the floor is yours. 
Good morning, colleagues. My name is Vasil Stoinov. I work in the team of Lukas on renewables and energy system integration policy, and I'm the policy officer in charge of the implementation of this uh, new window under the Connecting Europe facility. In the following minutes, I would like to present you what are we looking for under this call in terms of concrete uh, projects, but also in terms of uh, policy priorities. I will start off by the legal basis, which is framed by four legal acts. The first one is the financial regulation, which says how we should disburse EU funds in general. Then we have the renewable energy directive, which frames the scope of cross-border cooperation in the area of renewables and in general provides for enabling framework in support of renewables and part of this framework is also the connecting care facility. We have the facility itself which enables us to launch those calls and set the rules for those calls and we have a specific delegated regulation which specifies what does a cross-border project in the field of renewable mean. And I would like to pick up on this on this last point, um, and I want to set the the general framework for the those type of specific projects and what do uh, they come in. Um, next slide, please. So we refer to them as CB REST projects or cross border renewable energy projects. So this is a specific category of project developed by the CEF regulation. And the current call is part of the framework in support of those type of projects. So in order for a CB REST project to qualify as such, three main criteria needs to be met. First, this project should contribute to cost-effective deployment of renewables, meaning the project should be uh, framed around production of renewable energy as defined in the Renewable Energy Directive. Secondly, the project should be based on a cooperation mechanism. There are four mechanisms which are specified in the Renewable Energy Directive, and some of those forms, be it statistical transfer, be it a joint project between member states or member states and third country or joint support scheme, some of these types of cooperation should be underpinning the CB REST project, the cross-border project. This means there should be involvement of, of more than one country and they should cooperate with themselves on the implementation, preparation, planning, and, and monitoring of this project. And lastly, there needs to be a cost-benefit analysis. This is an analytical assessment of the project, comparing the costs, the positive, um, the costs and the benefits, the positive and the negative impact of the project. And there needs to be outcome of this analysis, which is positive, meaning uh, there needs to be evidence that the project based on cooperation is better off compared to a project without the cooperation aspect of it. Next slide, please. Having explained what is in general a CBRS project, cross-border renewable energy project, this year we have selected the first three projects. Uh, Mr. Beckers already mentioned them. Um, more concretely, those are uh, firstly the L-Wind project. This is a hybrid offshore wind project located in the Baltics. We have the Görlitz Zgorzelek uh, project, which is about um, a twin city located on the two sides of the border between Germany and Poland. And those two cities are building their efforts to set up a cross-border district heating system, which is zero carbon. And last, we have a Cicerone project, which is a um, project devoted to the hydrogen value chain involving four countries, uh, including location of hydrogen in uh, part of the countries and transportation and consumption of the hydrogen and the byproducts in other countries. So we have the already first examples which tell us in reality how, um, how the cross-border projects look like. Now, the next slide, please. I want to uh, explain the context of the CEF renewables window and where do we place our call that we discussed today. So first, we have the application stage. If you look on the left-hand side, we have the application state, uh, stage for Article 7, Paragraph 3 studies. Those are what we refer to as preparatory studies, and this is the call for studies that we are discussing uh, today. For those studies, 
um, you, an applicant, doesn't need to have the specific status for cross-border projects. Those are early stage studies which help a project turn into cross-border renewable energy projects. So the second stage, uh, if you go to the second row, this is the CBRS status application. So this is a call where project promoters apply to become and to receive the label of cross-border renewable energy project and to have the status. This status in turn allows the projects to apply to the next two stages, makes them eligible to apply. And those next stages are the grants for technical studies and the grants for works. So those grants are reserved only to projects that have the status. And the first call for preparatory studies is for projects who don't have the status, but the study will help them mature, develop, and um, turn and be able to participate in the call for the cross-border status. On the next slide, please, I am um, going to explain what does it entail to have a pre uh, preparatory study and what does the call for preparatory studies consist in. So. There is a paragraph in the CEF regulation which says that studies that aim to develop and identify cross-border projects in the field of renewable energy are eligible. So the general objective of the studies is to develop, meaning to prepare, and to help the identification of cross-border uh, projects in the field of renewable energy, those CBRS projects. In practical terms, we can narrow down the scope of the preparatory studies to a couple of um, aspects, and this is a non-exhaustive list, so simply an example for you what could be the content of such a preparatory study. So the first aspect could be that the preparatory study is exploring the possible sites in the territory of the member states in order to determine which will be the hosting in the participating countries, where the project will be located, and what will be the geographical, um, the geographical aspects of the project. Secondly, additional exploratory tax tasks which are related to the cost and the benefits of the project could be subject of the study. Mainly, the study could help the cost-benefit analysis of the project, which, as I explained, is one of the three main criteria for a project to qualify as CBRS project. Next, uh, the preparatory study could help with another aspect of the CBRS projects, which is the cooperation mechanism. It's not always an easy task to set up uh, all the details related to the sharing of the costs and the benefits about the participation by the countries, the financial participation, the participation in terms of statistical benefits, all those aspects which are in entailed in a cooperation mechanism between countries or EU country and third country could be subject also to the preparatory study. Next, the preparatory study can investigate which is the best form of support of, of a project, meaning uh, whether a support scheme is needed in the first place, what could be the form of the support scheme, who participates in the support scheme, how the financial aspects of the support scheme are shared between the participating countries and so on. So, summarizing, we have three types of support. One is grants for preparatory studies. This is what we're discussing today. We have grants for studies and grants for construction and for works. The second two types of grants are reserved only to the projects who have the status. And the first type of grant is grant which aims to help a project receive the status. The co-financing rates of all the studies are up to 50%, which means the CEF um, facility can co-finance uh, half of the costs of a project, which applies and uh, which uh, has uh, passed all the evaluation and then is awarded a grant. Next slide, please. We can uh, luckily give examples of two successful projects which have applied last year under the first call for preparatory studies. This is now uh, the second call. Uh, the first of those projects is the project Gorio. Uh, this project is uh, has the content of engineering study on how an offshore wind farm can be developed in the Gulf of Riga, the city of Riga in the Baltic, um, in, in the Baltic Sea. So the scope of this um, study is conceptual engineering and is located to the technical specifications and um, the engineering aspects of uh, offshore wind farm. 
The second project that we successfully selected is the project Energio Sobos. This project is devoted to uh, district heating in the border regions of Bavaria in Germany and Upper Austria. So those border regions want to uh, pull up their heat demand and provide a supply for this de heat demand in a more decarbonized manner. So the aim of the study is to investigate how much is the heat potential and the heat demand. So they're uh, looking at uh, sources of uh, district heating uh, as geothermal or as biomass or as uh, other innovative solutions. And they're looking also at the heat demand and how the two can be linked together jointly in this area where which has a good solar uh, potential and good geothermal potential, uh, but at the same time also a very strong industrial demand. So there you go with uh, two uh, practical examples. And um, that's, that's the type of projects we're looking at. More precisely, in the call for preparatory studies, we as Commission are not putting any barriers to the types of projects that can apply. So any type of project, any project setup, any project idea which is aimed at developing cross-border project and fulfills the criteria for a future cross-border project is eligible. However, in terms of policy priorities, we as Commission can share what type of projects we would like to see and what type of projects are matching our uh, policy priorities. So by policy priorities, I want to list a couple of initiatives, uh, official initiatives of the Commission, uh, which uh, we want to support in general. And we see the Connecting Europe facility as a very good and appropriate instrument to support those policy initiatives. And the first of those initiatives is the EU strategy on offshore renewable energy. So this strategy was uh, published in 2021 and puts forward the objective to have an installed capacity of offshore projects of at least 60 gigawatts of offshore wind and one gigawatt of ocean energy by 2030. So those are massive, um, this requires massive investments and a very solid project pipeline. So we would be, um, uh, we would be very encouraged to see projects that apply and uh, try to fit in this general objective uh, for increased, massively increased capacity for offshore wind. The second strategy, which is very recent, it was published in May this year, is the EU solar energy strategy. So this strategy put puts forward another objective to have an installed capacity of over 200, uh, 320 gigawatts of solar photovoltaics. In particular, um, this capacity should be implemented through rooftop uh, PV, so small scale installations which are um, contributing to self consumption and energy communities on the one hand side, but also utility scale installations. So if we see a project applying under the call for preparatory studies, which is um, aiming to develop a cross-border renewable energy project under the definition of CEF, and it is based on solar PV technology and is looking at exploring better the solar potential of Europe, uh, that would fit very well in the, um, uh, in the policy objectives of this strategy. Next. Uh, again, in May this year, the Commission has launched a hydrogen accel accelerator. Um, it was published as part of the Repower Plan. The objective of this accelerator is to make sure that by 2030, EU has a production of 10 million of tons of green hydrogen produced domestically. So projects which are looking into implementing this objective and setting up hydrogen projects based on domestic production of hydrogen projects will also be um, be very welcome and uh, we would appreciate highly the participation of this type of projects. So under those initiatives that I have listed, again, I want to make sure those are not eligibility requirements, those are not specific categories which are reserved for support. On the contrary, support is open to any type of project, but projects which fit into those policy initiatives 
would be considered as priority by the European Commission without any impact on the on the evaluation itself. So we simply want to give you a bit of a guidance on what we as Commission expect and what we as Commission would appreciate uh, as applications and future cross-border projects under the window under this window of the Connecting Europe facility. I hope this was clear. In case of additional questions, I am happy to take them as part of the Q&A session. Uh, with this, I want to conclude my presentation and turn back to Beatrice. Thank you very much. Uh Vasil, many, many thanks for giving us this very uh, precise and uh, clear presentation about the framework of, uh, for cross-border renewable energy projects, in particular in the context of this uh, preparatory uh, study phase. Uh, in the interest of time, I move to the next presentation. Uh, it will be, presentation will be given by myself. It's quite a long presentation, so uh, please bear, bear with me. The presentation will focus on both the evaluation process and the different selection steps, uh, as well as we will go through the award criteria in detail. But first of all, let us remind the tentative timeline for, uh, for the call. So the call was published on the 20th of September. Uh, the deadline is 10th of January 2023 at 17 uh, hours Brussels time. Uh, we intend uh, to perform the evaluation of proposals between uh, January and February next year, and uh, followed by uh, the so-called consultation of the Connecting Europe Facility Coordination Committee, so it's a committee of member states, uh, which will give uh, uh, their opinion on the, uh, on the project selected uh, for funding. After that, uh, we will launch the so-called grant preparation and we will inform all applicants about the results uh, with the intention to conclude at the very latest the grant, uh, um, the grant agreement for the selected projects by September 2023. Let us move now to the various uh, steps of uh, the selection process and particular of the evaluation process. So here you see what are the different phases and the principles for evaluation and selection. So first of all, when the, an application is submitted, uh, we will first go through the so-called uh, preliminary checks. So applications will be scrutinized for admissibility and eligibility, and I'll come to that in a moment. Then um, the, those who have uh, passed these first uh, checks will go through the evaluation. So it will be an assessment of the merits of the applications per the award criteria. And at the same time, we will also carry out the operational financial capacity check. The applications which uh, will be positively assessed in the evaluation phase, as I mentioned before, uh, will be uh, brought to uh, an evaluation committee and a final selection uh, phase uh, is, is taking place with the recommended draft list of proposals. This phase uh, is uh, carried out by, uh, the, uh, by DG Energy. Uh, and the final steps of the selection process are displayed in this slide. So once the, the, the list of, um, of selected, uh, of selected um, applications is uh, is, is prepared, is approved. Um, there is, let's say, um, inter-service consultation process which takes place at the Commission. And as I mentioned earlier, uh, the member states are consulted in the form of a coordination committee of Connecting Europe facility. And there is also information which is provided to the European Parliament, following which uh, the formal act of the Commission selection decision is, uh, can, be, can be executed. And then, uh, as I mentioned earlier, we move to the phase of grant agreement preparation and information to applicants. Now, let's move to describe in detail the first phase of the selection process, so admissibility and eligibility. Um, all the proposals uh, must be submitted before the call deadline, so 10th of January. So no application submitted afterwards will be considered admissible. 
the only way to submit a proposal is through the call page of the funding and tender portal electronic submission system. So it's electronic submission and no other types of submission like paper submissions uh, or email submissions are not admissible. The proposals uh, must be complete and they must contain all the requested information and all the required annexes. And you will hear from uh, Cinea's colleagues afterwards all what is required in terms of documents and in both, let's say, main documents and supporting documents. So we will not do, as Cinea, a follow-up on missing elements. So make sure, really, that by the deadline, everything is complete. Um, your application must be readable, accessible, and printable. And there is a limit on um, number of pages, which is 120, uh, the so-called Part B. Um, we move to eligibility, so proposals to be considered for selection must be eligible. So there are two types of eligibility that we look at. So one is the eligibility of the actions, so of the proposed activities, and another one is the eligibility of the applicants. Let's consider now the eligibility of actions. So first of all, your application must be, in a way, in scope of the call. So here we are looking of preparatory studies in the meaning of Article 7.3 of the CEF regulation. So preparatory studies that aim to develop and identify the cross-border projects in the field of renewable energies. Um, the, uh, the actions must, let's say in their scope, must uh, provide the support to member states and private promoters to advance cooperation ideas create momentum again amongst involved stakeholders, and with this generate a pipeline of cross-border renewable project. So basically, it's really a type of support to a project which is in a very, very early phase of development before this project will be included uh, in the list of cross-border res project. So what, these are the steps that Vasil recalled in his presentation. Um, so, again, it's, uh, in this slide we go through what could be, let's say, the possible scope of such an application or such a proposal. So, what we are looking for is, let's say, a proposal that, for example, could provide technical, economic or legal support in setting up this concept of cross-border cooperation or selecting the best project concept. Um, it could be a desktop studies where sites uh, of the project uh, are explored, in particular to determine hosting and participating countries, as well as also other exploratory, legal and economic tasks to assess the overall cost and benefits of a project, again, still at a very early phase. Uh, it could, the scope of proposal could be related to the identification and formalization of the underpinning cooperation mechanism, could also include uh, some stakeholder involvement activities and communication, and could also investigate what could be, for example, the best form of support, such as auctioning and tendering, uh, as well as aspects related, for example, to national greed, the market, and other rules, uh, which differ in the countries and they would need to be agreed upon. Um, to remind, and this is also covered in the, in the call text, that here we are really looking at, let's say, project of a short duration. Uh, we would consider projects uh, up to 24 months of duration. Uh, and normally we consider the starting date of the project um, after the grant signature. However, let's say it can also be on an exceptional basis that the, the, if your project is already started, uh, that the proposal submission date could be considered as a starting date. Uh, you have uh, heard that uh, the, um, the call for proposals as an indicative uh, overall budget amount of 1 million euro. It means that in terms of project budget, there are no restrictions, so any project budget is admitted but looking at the scope of um, the expected project, it is recommended for the budget to be in the range between 100,000 up to 350,000 euro. Uh, 
paying attention that the grant which is awarded may be lower than the amount requested. Okay, looking now at eligibility of participants, uh, the applicants, uh, eligible applicants, must be legal entities, public or, private pro pu public or private bodies, be established in one of the eligible countries, which are EU member states, or e EEA countries and other countries associated to the CEF program, uh, or countries which are negotiating an associating agreement. So, generally, no third countries uh, participants are eligible, with the only exception uh, that they can become eligible for funding if, they can, if their participation, uh, properly justified, will enable the, um, let's say, the implementation of a cross-border renewable project. But that's a real exception which must be really proven. Um, another important point of the selection process uh, concerns the checks of operational capacity and the next slide, financial capacity. So operational capacity check, what does it mean? So we will check if applicants have the know-how, qualifications and resources to successfully implement the project and contribute to their share. Uh, this demonstration, uh, this evidence, will have to be provided by applicants, uh, by, let's say, in specific forms, uh, application forms, so there is a specific section, and as well as by providing uh, um, applicants' activity reports of last year's. Normally, this, applies, this kind of check applies to private companies, uh, public bodies, member states organization, uh, TSOs, uh, and international organizations are exempted by this check. The second check uh, corresponds to the financial capacity check. Um, and this is, um, what, again, what does that mean? It means that uh, the applicants must have stable and sufficient resources uh, to implement the projects. Uh, and contribute to the shares. A financial capacity check so, will be carried out for beneficiaries which are being selected um, on the basis of documents that you will be requested to upload and the participant register during the grant preparation. So in principle, this is a check which is done ex post after your application is submitted and only if you are being selected for funding. Also in this case, the check is done, generally speaking, for uh, private companies and uh, public bodies uh, uh, or international organization or transmission system operators are exempted by this check. And uh, if your individual grant amount is less than 60,000 euro, you will not be uh, asked uh, to provide us documents for this check. Moving now to the evaluation um, process, let's go in detail to the description of the award criteria. So um, what does that mean? Uh, it means that you will have to describe in your uh, application forms a number of, uh, a number of information uh, on, on which basis uh, experts will assess um, how, let's say, your application matches the award criteria of the call. And we have five award criteria, uh, priority and urgency, maturity, quality, impact, and catalytic effect. Uh, there is a quantitative score, um, so uh, from zero to five. So in order to pass, let's say, the, uh, an application has to, has to get a minimum pass score of three. Uh, and there is an overall pass score of 15 out of 25. Of course, the quantitative score and, uh, uh, will correspond also to a qualitative assessment by, by the experts. And now I'll go through uh, each criterion one by one to explain what type of information you will have to provide in order to be assessed against this, uh, your application to be assessed against this award criteria. So let's move to priority and urgency of the action. Basically, um, here you have to demonstrate 
how the envisaged CBRES project will contribute to the sectoral policy objectives, which were recalled by, by Lukas in his presentation, and explain how your action and your project is aligned with uh, the 2030 climate and energy targets, in particular on renewables. Uh, you will also have to explain to which extent the action at EU level will re help to reach policy objectives more effectively and faster compared to a national level action only. And if applicable, there might be also synergetic elements, for example, with uh, sectors like in transport or digital, to see if, let's say, there is a um, possibility to significantly improve the socioeconomic climate of environmental benefits of envisaged cross-border project. So basically here, uh, what we will do is to evaluate the corresponding of your proposal with the sectorial, um, with the sectorial policy, uh, policy targets. And we will also, let's say, basically measure the EU level action and EU added value. Uh, moving to the next uh, our criterion, this is our criterion maturity. Maturity here means the maturity of the project, so the activities that you intend to carry out, against the development of a larger, let's say, cross-border REST project, which, as we have understood, let's say, this is just, let's say, the early phase, but it will come, let's say, at a much, let's say, late, later stage. Uh, so here we are assessing the maturity in the context of the development of the cross-border REST project. Um, at the same time, we want to measure the readiness and the ability of the project to start uh, by the proposed start date and to be completed by the proposed end date. Um, that will mean also a confirmation that the activities that you are proposing are mature enough, so to say, to be financed under this call, that you have completed already all the necessary steps, uh, all the preceding steps, or that they are, can be carried out without delay, and that, for example, any pending legal or administrative issues uh, which could prevent the proposed project from being implemented, they are really, let's say, on, under, uh, under being, re being resolved. An important point here is to, you will have to provide information on cooperation mechanism. This is a cross-border project, so how are you intending and what are, let's say, the your, the proof of the steps already taken so far to prepare a cooperation mechanism. It could be description of bilateral meeting, it could be letters of intent uh, between the two countries or, or, or similar. Um, it may be a point of attention on maturity here, given that, let's say, um, we are talking of projects at a very early phase, it could be really that what you are proposing is really the very first step of, uh, of a project. So that there are no, let's say, previous, uh, previous projects. So this is a bit, let's say, tricky, if I may say so. But um, pl please, let's say, in that case also, uh, provide all the confirmation and your assessment on the other proposed points which fall under maturity. Um, the next one is uh, quality. So quality uh, criterion here, we are evaluating the soundness of the implementation plan proposed, both from technical, financial point of view, uh, the organizational structure and cooperation between applicants, what are the resources uh, needed to implement the project, and also we are looking at project management, uh, quality assurance control procedures, and also very important is uh, if you as applicant have identified risks for your project implementation and what are the mitigation measures. Uh, so it's a bit of a classical um, uh, criterion, uh, implementation criteria here for project. Uh, maybe a point of attention relates to project management costs because according to the call, they should not exceed 10% of total project costs. Uh, the next uh, work criterion is the impact. Uh, 
Um, here, uh, we uh, want to, let's say, we will analyze information that you will describe concerning the economic, social, and environmental impact, including the climate impact of, of the project. Um, so, at the same time, we are looking at uh, the impact of what you are proposing as a project um, for the larger, let's say, envisaged cross-border project. So, for example, it could touch upon preparation of cooperation agreement, what is this cross-border dimension, and also network integration. Um, so, for example, at the same time, we, you, you will have to describe the proposed project's contribution towards the development and identification of the envisaged CBRS project. So, here we are looking, um, your project under preparatory study phase is really, let's say, one of the first steps towards the preparation of a larger CBRS project, and you will have to describe how the activities proposed here fit into, let's say, the development of the larger envisaged cross-border project. Um, if, let's say, already um, there are information available, you could also provide uh, information on cost death benefits of the global CBRS project at the added value of the project in terms, as I mentioned, of cross-border dimension, economic, social, and environmental impact, and climate impact. Last but not least, uh, that's a very important uh, award criterion because here it comes uh, uh, to basically justifying why you are asking for money from the EU. So here we are looking at an explanation from your side on how the EU grant will facilitate or accelerate the envisaged cross-border project in comparison to a situation without the EU funding. So, it's a qualitative uh, information, but try to be here really as precise and as clear as, uh, as possible. You will also have to demonstrate uh, the existence of a gap in the financing of the project. And if there are already, let's say, you support expected under other, um, under, other amount, under other programs, like for example, the Recover and Resilience Facility, um, you should also indicate that. Um, to conclude, maybe let's say some points of attention, and uh, you will hear also from, uh, from my colleagues later on. We will go through with you all, uh, let's say, the relevant, uh, the relevant documents um, necessary for your applications. So here uh, you will see that there are different, uh, different documents, different criteria, uh, so different type of information to be filled in, uh, but please, uh, you have to ensure coherence and consistency across your application. Uh, again, um, make sure that your application is complete and do a, let's say, a triple or a quadruple check that all the uh, documents, in particular the supporting documents, are included. Another point I want to stress uh, that really you have to demonstrate why you need EU fund for this project. And, uh, and just let's say a little point of attention, we have talked here about the term uh, project uh, using application forms. Uh, um, there are also, let's say, there is also the term action, which is used in self-regulation. Uh, these, two, these two terms are here synonymous. And now we go, we, I conclude my presentation with a few, uh, let's say, words about what happens after the evaluation. Next slide. So once we have concluded the evaluation, um, all proposals will be informed. So you will receive from CINEA an evaluation result letter. Uh, so if you are successful, that letter will also invite you for a grant preparations. The other ones may be put on a reserve list or rejected. Um, if you are invited to a grant preparation, um, please note that uh, this is not a formal commitment for funding because we will still have to go through uh, a number of legal checks or financial checks and exclusion checks as well. Um, if you believe that uh, there was, a, let's say, a flaw in the evaluation procedure of your application, you can submit a complaint, and uh, the letter that you will receive 
as also, let's say, all the information concerning the process and the deadlines. Um, the next slide concerns uh, grant preparation. So what does it mean? So if you are selected as a successful applicant, CINEA will invite you to prepare a grant agreement preparation. Again, this will be done by the e grants tool together with you, project officer. So the grant preparation is not only the legal and the financial check, which I mentioned, um, which are quite formal, but it, that, that also, let's say, there will be a dialogue, which has to be also concluded, let's say, in, in a swiftly manner, uh, in order to fine tune technical and financial aspect, the milestones, the deliverable. And in a few cases, there could be that uh, the evaluation committee proposes some recommendations on improvement of, a proposal of your application or some policy recommendations that should be taken into account. And so this will also be covered during the grant agreement preparation. You will hear um, in the second part of, um, of today's info day a presentation on the model grant agreement uh, by our legal colleagues. So you will hear all what is applicable. And uh, please note that this is, let's say, these provisions are not, uh, not negotiable. Um, you will find also the same uh, document um, as well as other templates and guidance, again, in the portal. So with this, I think it was a long presentation. I want to thank you for, uh, for your attention. Uh, this is, let's say, our last slide, which also has uh, our uh, functional mailbox. So CINEA SEF Renewables. Uh, please uh, make sure to use this functional mailbox if you want to, um, if you want, if you have some questions. Uh, our procedure is that um, we are uh, reply to these questions um, in an, let's say, in the, we will reply not individually by email, but we will reply via uh, an FAQ page which you will find also in, uh, in the portal, so that, uh, let's say, for equal treatment, um, all the questions during the applications are uh, received, which are relevant, are uh, open, let's say, to be seen by all, uh, by all applicants. I think I want to conclude here, and uh, I, would like, I would like to open now uh, the Q&A sessions, and, uh, So we are here to reply to your questions. I, have, I see a first one. It is possible to apply. In the self. Oh, yes, in principle, yes. OK, so the question is, is it possible to apply with a project for CBRS in the CEF 2022 and also apply as a potential PCI project for the coming list by the end of this year? So uh, here we are talking of two different um, streams. Uh, so um, here we are, so today we are talking about the application for preparatory studies for a grant for a study under CEF. Um, there will be, let's say, uh, a call uh, by DGNR on uh, opening up to projects of common interest under the Trans-European Network Regulation. Uh, this process will be opened very soon by DGNR. Uh, so this will be covered by them, um, if I'm not mistaken, even next week, to all, uh, let's say, potential applicants and to all stakeholders. So, uh, to, so there are two different work streams uh, or procedures, and uh, the reply, therefore, to the question is yes, it is possible. These two procedures or these two processes, they are underpinned by different legal bases, by different objectives. So you will be then assessed, let's say, in a different way, of course, according to the two different, let's say, legal framework and policy framework. But the reply to the question is a yes. Okay, does the EU Commission determine the amount of financing for a project or does the applicant ask for a specific amount of money within the application process? 
So um, you will have to ask in the application process for uh, your uh, requested EU grant amount, which corresponds to, uh, let's say, the activities you want to carry out with a specific, let's say, co-financing rate. Uh, we will go through all this in the next uh, presentations. Uh, so the EU Commission, um, let's say, has the possibility, if you are selected, either to accept the amount that you have proposed, that you have requested, uh, but it could also lower your uh, requested amount um, if it was excessive, if it was uh, not fully in line with uh, the activities, or it can, let's say, the Commission can also uh, propose, I will assess, and, um, and the amount might also be exactly the same that you have requested. I hope I replied well. No, no, okay, okay. Okay, so how many further calls are expected after the second call and when? Okay, so we have a call for preparatory studies which is open now until the 10th of January. Uh, next year, uh, we will open, um, uh, and maybe before next year, we will open another call this year, uh, which is not for preparatory studies, but it's for technical studies and works. And this call, which we expect to open early November, is uh, dedicated only for the projects which have already received the status, uh, so the label of status under, let's say, the, the, the previous call, and which are, uh, let's say, so very, very limited amount of projects. But next year, in 2023, we expect to open the call for status, so which is basically a call for expression of interest, so no self-grant involved. Also very early in the year, uh, first quarter, uh, the projects which will apply there will be selected uh, to and will be, let's say, um, become projects uh, with the status. And again, the cycle will continue. So in 2023, we will open another call for works and studies. Uh, so later, maybe later on in the year, so second half. And uh, it, we also intend, or it is intended, according to the CEF Energy Multiannual Work Program, uh, to open another call for, uh, for preparatory studies in 2023. And this will probably be also later, uh, so second half of uh, 2023. Uh, what is the budget for grants in the works and studies call? Um, at this stage, uh, the budget uh, is, uh, let's say, in the process of being discussed, so um, I'm afraid I cannot really give an indicative figures, but uh, stay tuned because the call will be uh, launched uh, in a few weeks.
Okay. So as the new CBA methodology for hydrogen projects been released and how it can be accessed. Um, so here, uh, I would like to clarify that we have a CBA methodology for cross-border renewable projects and uh, this CBA methodology uh, is, uh, is available um, already uh, as a staff working document. And there are uh, also, let's say, templates, uh, and Excel templates on how to fill this CBA methodology in our uh, INSINEA website. They relate to uh, the call for status. So if you want to become, uh, a, if you want to have the status of CBRES project, then you will have to prepare a methodology according, let's say, to this, to this basis. So it refers to, uh, to cross-border RES. Um, I'm not sure here we are talking of um, uh, hydrogen projects as such. I mean, they can use that, uh, that uh, methodology, which is general for all, uh, for many projects categories. Um, there are, let's say, also specific methodologies being developed in the context of the Trans-European Network Framework, so for projects of common interest. Um, in order, let's say, to align to the new provisions of TENI, but uh, this is not part here of, uh, of uh, yeah, it's not part of the scope of uh, uh, CBRS. So the question is, how often is the PCI of transnational CBRES project uh, uh, is updated so that a qualified status project can apply immediately to the next open works call? Uh, so basically, once you are uh, selected uh, and you are in the list of cross-border rest project, you stay in the list, uh, provided that uh, uh, you comply with, uh, let's say, EU laws, um, there is also a process of uh, monitoring of the CBRS projects to see that these projects are advancing um, so that the project can still make sense. So if you get this status project, normally, let's say, um, uh, we will launch a call for, for studies and works in the next, let's say, months. But you can, you remain, let's say, basically, if all the conditions are met, you remain in this list of cross-border projects. So you can also apply, for example, uh, the next uh, in one year time, for example, on two years time, depending on the maturity of, uh, of your project. So we are not receiving any more uh, Slido questions, so I suggest we take now a break. Uh, so we will be back not at 11.30, but uh, 11.05, that's okay. If there are still, let's say, questions on the first session, we can take it also later on, uh, so no problem. So now we take a little break and we resume at 11.05. Thanks for, uh, for being with us and thanks for following us.
Good morning, everyone. Welcome back to the info day. So we'll start the second part of the meeting with a series of presentation more going into details on how to write a good proposals, have a look at the budgetary aspects and also the legal aspects and also have a look also at the portal itself with the with the live demo. There is still uh, there was still during the break a last uh, question uh, in the meantime. So to be clear, is it possible to apply for grants for preparatory studies for a project without PCI status? Yes, absolutely. The two the two um, processes are completely separated, so you don't uh, you don't have to apply for PCI status. To uh, to apply for the, for this call, and um, and 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 if you if this call is really to prepare to help you prepare your project and then to apply for CBRS status and the CBRS status call next one uh, the call will be launched in the in the first uh, months of uh, uh, 2023 so in in a few months time. Um, and really the process are, are, are really quite um, completely separated and uh, um, then it's up to you to see which one would you see it more fitting, rather the PCI or the CBRS, depending on the nature of the project that you are looking uh, to uh, implement or to develop and then to implement. So yes, you can absolutely apply. You don't need a status of CBRS status to apply for this preparatory store call. This is really to help you actually to, to get ready to the next uh, or to the following uh, status call if you want. Um, with that, we will continue keeping uh, questions uh, for later on. And I'll um, hand over to my colleague Camilla uh, Paquel, who will uh, drive you through how to prepare a successful project proposal. Camilla, the floor is yours. Thank you, Gianluca. Um, my name is Camila Paquel. I'm a project advisor in the um, ICINEAS team dealing with cross-border renewables, a renewable energy financing mechanism. I'll walk you through um, how to prepare a successful proposal for this call. Uh, so a little bit of tips and tricks uh, for the preparatory studies uh, for CBRES projects, successful uh, proposals. So the call, a call is open. You have uh, plenty of time. Uh, but uh, we believe that these um, guidelines will help you prepare best uh, your application. Uh, you'll have a little bit of overview on the funding and tender portal. Um, uh, we will walk you through the terminology, so just to, for you to feel, uh, feel well and comfortable with the, the terms that you will see in the call text. Uh, we'll have a look at the quality of your proposal and the uh, checklist, so the, the helpful um, list of things to remember and do's and don'ts. Uh, funding and tender portal is a hub uh, for all the funding and, uh, and uh, opportunities to apply for EU uh, financial support. Um, there is a dedicated call page, so the, the call uh, on preparatory studies under um, SEV for cross-border renewable energy projects. You can follow it from the presentation. You can also find it uh, on the funding tender uh, portal um, uh, by yourself. There is also a user guide, which is very friendly, so we encourage you to use it uh, if, you, if you're lost. You will have, um, for instance, the, um, all the information regarding the call budget, uh, linked to uh, the FAQ. Um, there might be other interesting elements um, on, on, on this web pages. Uh, when we talk about the project, um, it is uh, a project as we understand it, so something uh, that it was used to be um, um, uh, called an action in the SEF regulation. It is uh, basically um, uh, isolated financially and technically um, set of actions, so a, a project that, that you apply for, uh, for support from SEF. So make sure that you always clearly state whether you uh, refer to your proposed action or the envisaged CBRES project as such, because you may have a bigger ambition, and that's, that's basically the case if you're applying for preparatory studies, is that you have um, uh, this cooperation agreement 
based project in mind. Uh, this is what we call a CBRES project, but you are applying for your preparatory study. So this is a project in the in, in the meaning that um, you will see in the templates, for instance, of this kind of right here, right now, you need preparatory study, and this is your project. This project will support the CBRES project overall. So the, this is the, the kind of uh, distinction that um, may be helpful for you. We have also the this jargon in, in uh, grants that is um, uh, includes the word or the term work package. A work package is uh, a major subdivision of your of your project, of your preparatory studies project. Um, this uh, work package uh, will be then ra uh, divided into tasks. I will go um, with you th uh, th through it, uh, but maybe that's that's something to be to be kept in mind that you will have a project divided into several work packages four or five packa four work packages, more or less, uh, that uh, can include all uh, major um, activities um, in your project. They can run in parallel, they can be sequential. It's up to you, it just has to um, make sense. Um, task is a subdivision of the work package. Uh, you will uh, have a template that uh, that guides you through it, so uh, there is no way uh, uh, to escape it. You will uh, have to think about how you want to structure your project in terms of work packages and then tasks. There is no need to define the subtasks. Uh, as you will see in this template, that, that it can be also downloaded from the Funding and Tenders portal, you have to give your task a name and the description. You also uh, define the participants in these uh, tasks and that you have to say whether they will be uh, in the lead uh, of coordination of this task or uh, they will be um, just um, uh, just as, as beneficiaries, just as supporting actors. And then uh, also you should define subcontracting. Some tasks may be uh, heavily dependent or, or even totally subcontracted. Uh, so, yeah, please bear in mind that this is everything that um, that you should already know at the application stage. For subcontracting, we um, require an estimate percentage of subcontracting, so if, if it is not set in stone, it can uh, be just an overall estimation of how much you will need uh, of uh, outside of your uh, project. A consortium or, or uh, outside of your, your mono beneficiary application. Um, we have another word that is useful for applicants. It's a milestone. A milestone in the uh, universe of EU grants is a major control point that uh, help you to manage your project. So if you listen to this presentation, you're likely to be a project coordinator which means that you have a little bit more responsibility than others uh, for the delivery, because you have to make sure that the project is delivered well and that it is delivered on time. Milestones are your friends then. You should have a milestone that is easy to understand also to your project partners, and that helps you to monitor the progress of the project. So basically, you would normally have a, a at least one milestone per year and one uh, starting and one end milestone per work package. Um, they should be also not the same as deliverables. Deliverables are project outputs, uh, something that you can uh, basically upload to the uh, EU system. Um, and deliverables may be like, for instance, a signed letter of intent by the member state or a um, cooperation agreement. Milestones are more, um, uh, I'd say, abstract uh, because it, it cannot be physically touched, but it can be definitely something that you can report on. Um, we are looking for a proposal that avoid jargon, so we don't avoid jargon because we need it, but you should. Uh, so try to avoid jargon uh, from any, um, any uh, universe you're currently active. 
uh, and we try to use a simple language. So we don't need uh, legalese, we don't need uh, to, um, to, to have our own jargon uh, cited uh, to make it uh, uh, understandable for the EU. Uh, just use the simple language to explain uh, your uh, concept and uh, all the tasks and work packages that you'd like to um, that you'd like to have um, EU support for. Uh, the information uh, should be easy to find. So you should uh, demonstrate how your proposal addresses the award criteria. We provide templates that help you with that. Uh, don't make um, the uh, job of the evaluators uh, more difficult uh, by putting, for instance, information um, in uh, different parts that is not related to the information you're providing. So basically, a uh, very um, professional tip from my side would be to read the template first and see which part of information fits in which part of the template. Um, chances are 100% that all the required information that you need to provide in your proposal are already in the template. So they are already, uh, we, the template asks you these questions. You don't need to uh, repeat them and you don't need to um, basically uh, struggle to find um, the appropriate part of the template. Mandatory annexes is something that you must upload with your uh, main application in order for the uh, proposal for the application to be uh, admitted for evaluation. And then there are some uh, voluntary annexes such as maps and graphs. Uh, that uh, are up to you, so you're free to upload them if you like. Um, in quality of the proposal, we also look at the scope of the project. So we want to uh, be able to find answers to the following questions. What is the project about? What are the technical parameters of this project? Who will carry out the project? How and when will the project objective uh, be reached, and why are you, you proposing this action, and what are the expected results of the project? For the CBRES preparatory studies, we look at, uh, you heard about it in the first part of this info day, what, what it is that we, uh, we uh, look for, but it may be anything that helps you advance with this cooperation idea that you have for the CBRES project, it may be a technical study, it may be uh, both. Um, it is also uh, free um, for you to choose whether you want to um, carry out the project as a mono beneficiary, so one beneficiary only, or there is, um, there is a consortium behind. Uh, you may involve the member states, you may be a member state on its own, you may subcontract a lot, you may subcontract very little, but all of that has to be uh, already described in the proposal. Um, how and when, this is how, how we look at it. Um, the work packages, tasks, milestones and deliverables, as I already mentioned, will help us uh, define uh, the timing and uh, the, the ways of your implementation. And then uh, we would like to see why you are proposing this action. So the cooperation agreement signed is something that is very important in this call. Uh, the willingness of at least two member states to carry out this action is, um, is mandatory. It doesn't have to be a fully fledged cooperation agreement yet. It must maybe a letter of su support, but definitely um, not the support just to the um, some kind of abstract uh, self-supported action, but to actually um, letter of intent to, to think about the cooperation agreement uh, being signed in the future and, and think about it seriously. Um, quality of the proposals, uh, again, will be judged based on the content of your work packages. So uh, you should think about the, their objectives. So um, we've seen some work packages defined as questions uh, to, uh, that, that need to be answered, but that is just an example of, of the kind of question that you have behind each work package. It is basically um, 
your role to define the objective of, of each work, work packages of work package and then when you summarize all of these objectives it should uh, equal to the overall objective of, of your project of your preparatory study. Um, the clear work package name matching the description will help uh, in quality of your proposal. Um, then uh, for tasks, deliverables and milestones, uh, think about what are the tasks, what are the deliverables and what are the milestones for your project. Don't um, don't uh, overestimate, but don't underestimate this part either. Uh, as I said, uh, if you happen to be the project coordinator, these are helpful tools for the implementation of the project. So not only will it help you be awarded the SEV grant if you do it well, but if you uh, already have the SEV grant, it will help you with the implementation. So just to repeat, uh, the rule of thumb for, uh, for milestones is that each work package should have at least two milestones, the starting and the ending milestone, and we uh, would like to see at least one milestone per year. Um, so um, the don't overdo it. We don't need more. More is not better. It's just really should be at least one milestone every 12 months if it makes sense more often, but if it doesn't, don't include milestones that are superfluous. Means of verification should be reliable and realistic. So if the milestone is that you published a tender, we would like to be able to see it. Um, for instance, if you have a public website where you publish the tender documents, um, if you have a, a key stakeholder meeting organized and, and uh, some decision making, uh, successfully accomplished in that meeting, uh, we would like to see the minutes of that meeting. The minutes of that meeting are not a milestone. The decision taken in that meeting is a milestone, but the means of verification are the minutes. Um, so just if you didn't have enough of milestones yet, um, we have another slide about it, uh, just to show you how the um, how the template looks like. You should define the due date of the milestones and um, everything um, that I said previously. So uh, it should be clear by now. Um, what will be evaluated is the cons coherence of your proposal and um, some kind of um, common thread that runs through your proposal combining all the objectives in the work packages, they should be interlinked. So that is uh, also your, your role to, to be mindful of and uh, try to make sure that uh, the external reader of your proposal understands the, these interlinkages between the work packages. So you uh, plan the resources also the accurately. If there is a major work package, it might be very well justified that it's also more most resource intensive. But if we have a work package that is um, taking a lot of time and a lot of resources, but has no connection to other work packages, for instance, that that is not a good sign. So so be be mindful of of these uh, links between work packages, but also the intensity of resources and time that you need to implement them. Uh, the information should, in one part of the application, should match information in another part of the application. So uh, if you have support of three member states, uh, please make sure that this is uh, consistent across. If you only have, um, um, for instance, two member states mentioned in one place of the proposal and then in the annex you have, for instance, three letters of intent. It is all very good that you have these three letters, but it will be not very coherent with the body of the application, hence you may lose some point on quality. So be mindful of these uh, small things that may, uh, may just confuse the evaluators of all. Um, Gantt chart is, is important. 
think about it, try to make sure it, it is um, a helpful tool to see the work package dates, the starting date, the end date, the milestones, some key deliverables, for instance. Um, and also the Gantt chart will help the evaluators to see the sense that you made of work packages overlapping in time or being sequential, so that is also something uh, that is best represented in the Gantt chart. Uh, please present your information in a logical way. Uh, so, for instance, the, when, you, when you define the tasks in the work package on management, for instance, uh, also try to um, put, put some kind of a logical order to them. Uh, if you describe administrative procedures, uh, maybe try to follow a chronological order so that we, uh, we see uh, that you have it also uh, thought through and um, it's all realistic. The justification of your resources uh, should be um, well presented. Uh, don't uh, try to, um, for instance, uh, do some of these things that we, we just uh, maybe uh, uh, want to raise your attention to, such as put, uh, pro putting project management cost at more than 10% of the total project cost. This is not, not a good practice, so just keep them to 10% or below. Um, then, uh, if you if you have um, resources allocated uh, to a given task or work package, try also to explain that. So uh, we need to know uh, why you are needing it and what why, for instance, this cost intensity uh, has been defined in the way it was. The level of detail of uh, for the risk assessment, you will see this in the template. You have a risk assessment part. Uh, will be um, also looked at and here you should think about the negotiations for instance with the member states so if you have already a letter of intent and all is going well in the cooperation agreement uh, uh, this is all very good but you may uh, for instance have an election coming and a major sweeping change in political decision making uh, which may delay the process so something that you thing is smooth now, may start being less smooth in one year. This is all uh, very good, but, but you should mention it in a risk table. And additionally, you should think of mitigation measures, such as, for instance, early involvement with the new officials or other mitigation measures that help uh, to attenuate the negative impact of that risk. So um, through the risk list, what the evaluators see is basically whether you have a good grasp on the action, the project you're proposing, whether you have it realistically embedded in the technical but also policy uh, realities that will shape your preparatory study. Uh, please make sure your application is complete you will have to uh, submit application form part A, which is uh, very structured. You've seen parts of it as a template on the, on the slide, but it's, it's also in the funding and tender portal. You have application form part B, which is a Word document. It will be uploaded as a PDF, and it will uh, contain the technical description of the project. No need to write essays either. It's just to be... Um, very um, comprehensive but also uh, succinct in the way you describe your project. This description will then be used, for instance, for the online publicity of your project, for instance, and, um, and so, so it's, it is important to get the part B right as well. Detailed budget table per work package. You will have an Excel also with the template to be filled and annexed. Um, the counter I mentioned, um, you also have a template available. Uh, the agreement by the concerned member states the letter of support. Uh, so that has to be also very, I, I will go to, to the details later, but this is an important annex. All of them uh, are uh, mandatory, but, but basically this one is, um, 
is something that uh, defines not only the completeness of your project, but there will be uh, a lot about your preparatory study to, to be judged uh, from this letter of support as well. CBA uh, related calculations, this is optional. Uh, you can uh, submit it as an uh, under other annexes. For some entities, we require annual activity reports, especially if you're a private organization that uh, is not uh, TSO. Um, you, you may need to um, upload also your annual activity report. The famous letter of support is, is some kind of a first sign that the cooperation agreement as we define it under a Renewable Energy Directive will, will happen in the future. So this letter of support should be signed by the uh, ministries, the relevant ministries of the participating uh, member states. Uh, by relevant ministries, I mean those ministries that are in charge of implementing the future cooperation agreement. So you may uh, want uh, to check um, the, we have a list of contact uh, people in the ministries from the EU member states that are in charge of it. So, so if you're not sure which ministry is in charge, you can check that. The letter of support uh, can be also signed by uh, the, at the regional level, uh, provided that uh, this uh, region has the competence uh, to implement uh, this CBRS project. And then, uh, if so, uh, this is the case, uh, with the application, we also require a document from the central authority that just confirms that it's the regional competence to implement the CBRS project or another type of official evidence of regional competence. But uh, but I think um, if you if you have uh, the central authorities uh, stamp of a stamp of confirmation that it is the regional uh, remit, uh, all the better. The member state concerned is the member state in which territory uh, the proposed project will take place. Uh, imagine you may have, um, uh, for instance, a um, project that is between two non-neighboring countries. And one will be the hosting country, and another one will be more the kind of a paying country or contributing financially to it. You may have different setups, basically depending also on the cooperation agreement. But uh, we uh, need to have um, the all the member states that will be participating in this cooperation agreement have to sign, and also third countries if that's the case. And um, if there is no physical intervention, then the proposed project will be understood as implemented in the country of the applicant. So for instance, if uh, this is a project submitted by consultants in Belgium, and it will be all only the study and scoping about the project that will happen, for instance, in Sweden and uh, Finland, then we don't need only um, so basically, we will assume that this is the Belgium implemented um, project. However, um, if there are actions uh, that require also, uh, so the project will be understood as implemented in uh, these two other countries like uh, Finland and Sweden, then we also need these two countries uh, as they are the member states concerned. Uh, you have other information about the letter of support, including those contact details to the uh, relevant ministries uh, in the FAQ uh, section, but also in the uh, on the web page uh, of the call. If you uh, plan to uh, procure services, uh, please keep in mind that uh, you should uh, do it uh, in line with the rules, with the rules that are uh, applicable to you. So they will be defined by national law and depending on your status and also the, uh, the amount of, of the procurement, uh, the volume of the procurement contract, the EU, uh, EU laws. Uh, during the implementation, we at CINA will verify the procurement um, compliance with these rules at the payment time. And if we see that there is no compliance, uh, we may reject cost and re reduce support and practice. If we uh, suspect non-compliance, we ask for additional information. Should that 
not be provided, then then it um, it's uh, we just basically the EU money is protected in that way that uh, these costs are not deemed uh, to be accepted and paid. Um, in any case, uh, to if you want to comply uh, with the um, with with public procurement, but also in basically any uh, kind of uh, public spending from the EU budget, uh, you should apply the sound financial management principles. This, these principles are of economy, efficiency and effectiveness. Uh, best value for money or, or the, the cheapest price, basically. Um, so we usually require at least three offers uh, that consider the quality of the service, the, uh, and the good or the work proposed. Um, avoiding conflict of interest. Conflict of interest has also a very interesting definition. You don't need to have a family link to the person um, to have a conflict of interest. It may be uh, anything uh, that um, bounds your choice to, um, to entities that constrain uh, competition. So basically, you also could uh, be interested in this definition of the conflict of interest before you think of who you'd like to subcontract, and um, that will be um, that this avoidance of conflict of interest will need to be also demonstrated uh, before the payments. The transparency we we need to uh, see also how you advertised uh, the tender uh, before the award of the contract uh, that it was uh, the, the the delays were respected. For instance, that it was. Uh, a public website, not a not a kind of a private website, that, and you provided links to three entities, for instance. So all of this should just make sense to uh, to be as transparent and open as possible. Uh, equal treatment and non-discrimination are are another principles that we look at um, also in terms of the um, the free market and the, um, our EU principles of free movement of goods. Um, and services, but also people and capital. Uh, public procurement aspects uh, will be um, already asked in the, um, in the application form, so in the part A. You, uh, when you remember this table, you have this part on subcontracting, uh, where you have to uh, describe how much uh, you estimate to sub that you want to subcontract. And then uh, also uh, there is a, a section that asks you about the status of contracting procedures and authorization approvals and permits. Uh, it might be that you are an entity that's used to public procurement, that you have some contracts in place already, and you will uh, rely on the, them uh, in this preparatory study project. This is all very fine. Uh, the, what what now is likely to ask for is the proof that these um, existing contracts were indeed uh, signed um, uh, with uh, the respect of the sound uh, financial management rules. So um, all of that applies um, and is quite pragmatic in the end. Uh, we just want to be sure that you are complying with the rules. Uh, we are all bound at CINEA to, um, to also avoid fraud, every irregularity. So we would help ask you for help with that. Um, and uh, by design of your project application, uh, make sure that you avoid any irregularities. Irregularity is, is not a fraud, if, not, if it's not intentional, but if, we, if it is intentional, even small irregularities may be labeled as fraud. And we have the European Anti-Fraud Office that, um, that works uh, with us um, to prevent that EU money is uh, going where it shouldn't. Uh, you have an applicant's checklist. Uh, so basically, uh, check it that your proposal fits in the scope of the 2022 work program and the call for proposals that uh, so on, on preparatory uh, studies. Uh, check that uh, you indeed address the objectives and results expected from the call. It is, uh, it is very important that you do. So do read the call text and the work program and uh, remember that it's very simple. Your proposal will be evaluated based on those criteria that are specified in the call. 
and only on, based on the information you provide in your application. How you make a link between the two is your call, is your decision, but it is a very, um, very straightforward situation where you have the call document and you have an application and the two should make sense together. Uh, please apply by the deadline, but not maybe don't wait until 10 of January um, because it will maybe be too late um, uh, to start preparing everything um, uh, on the deadline. So you still have plenty of time, but, um, but try to uh, work on it uh, early. And uh, you can have also some questions to us, which, which uh, we can reply, but, but just foresee the time that is needed to prepare a very good or excellent application. Uh, when you submit the application, you will get an email. If you didn't get an email confirming that you submitted, uh, something went wrong, you may want to um, contact the help desk. So uh, just be sure that you got the confirmation. Check that all um, sections of application from part A are filled in directly in the funding and tenders platform. Read through, complete, print out, scan and upload the application form part B. Attach all mandatory annexes, including the letters of intent. And then uh, make sure you proofread your proposal. Do at least one last check, maybe even with some other uh, pair of eyes than the, the, the key pen holder for the proposal so that you are sure that you uh, you provided all information coherently, that it's easy to follow, that you include everything that's needed, um, that even things that may be evident to you, like the local context may be important to highlight uh, for the external reader that's, uh, that's not embedded in your local context. Um, evaluator will only look at what you provided in the proposal. No assumptions will be made. They will not be browsing the internet to find additional information. Make sure that your proposal is precise and that it is clearly responding to all the questions and that it is showing why it should be awarded Connecting Europe Facility Energy Funding. Why this one needs the support, why, why it's, it's beneficial to the action. And make sure that you uh, submit uh, the proposal using the application forms and templates provided in the portal. It is mandatory to use these templates, but it is also very helpful to use them. So it is it's a win-win situation. And you uh, are uh, very welcome to contact us at Cinea Self Energy Calls at EC Europa EU. It's our uh, functional mailbox, but there are friendly people behind uh, who will be uh, replying to your um, questions in due time. So usually up to several days, if, if it's a, um, depending on the situation, but it may, may take um, uh, just a couple of hours uh, to a few days. But don't wait with it until the, uh, the beginning of January. And uh, you also can follow us on Twitter and, um, and the website and LinkedIn. And, and we even have our YouTube channel. So thank you very much for listening. Good luck with your application. And let's stay in touch. Thank you. Thank you, Camilla, for this very useful, I, I think, presentation on really on the nitty gritty of the evaluation and the, on, the, on the key aspect to take into account when you will be uh, digging into the details and of the, um, uh, especially when, when looking at the templates can be, can be always a little bit uh, complex when you are first comers. And for those of you that have already uh, worked with those type of templates or uh, the e-grants environment that we'll look at it uh, later on with Christina, uh, it's, uh, may, it may sound actually uh, fairly straightforward. Um, I will uh, lead you through the budget part of the, of the presentation and then uh, be, uh, after that we will have the legal part and then uh, Christina will 
drive us through the demo of the e-grant environment. Uh, um, so there's nothing uh, revolutionary for those who are, of you who are familiar with the system. Basically, uh, the budget is uh, organized, so to say, in cost categories, which are, um, let's say, typology of, pro of cost and uh, work packages, which are rather um, organization following the, the, the theme or the type of the activities you do, basically. So the work packages, uh, Camilla showed you how, how they are structured and the cost categories, I'll come to that uh, in a moment. Uh, you have to encode both type of information uh, and you will see some of the information are directly <coughs> encoded in the system and other will be simply encoded through an Excel uh, file, which is for download in the call page. You will fill it in and then simply upload it once it is done. So the cost categories, uh, again, uh, structural information. So this, uh, this type of cost or the, this part of the budget will have to be encoded directly in the funding and tender portal. There are uh, five cost categories in the system, so personnel, subcontracting, purchase, other costs, and indirect cost. However, not all these uh, budget lines or cost categories are um, applicable, so the system doesn't preset the uh, cost categories that are applicable to the call. Uh, for, for IT constraints, so you really have to have a look at the call text. There is a specific paragraph uh, explaining which are the cost categories that are um, eligible for this call. Um, and notably, the cost category indirect cost and the cost category D1 financial support of third parties are not applicable. So um, don't be um, confused when you see the system, there is a bigger table, but no, not all of the, those information are actually um, applicable for, for your application on the preparatory study. So the, what are these cost categories? You may have seen budget lines in other, in other contests. Here are called cost categories. It's exactly the same. Um, so typical cost categories. So the uh, A is the personal cost. So any you know, cost related to personnel, so salary, for example, uh, of, a, of, a, of an employee working uh, to the project. Uh, that's a typical cost that would, uh, you will enter into the personal cost. Subcontracting cost for uh, good service and works needed to uh, carry out the proposed project. So in, in your case, um, uh, while well you have, you can have various typology of, uh, of, uh, of subcontracting, but uh, uh, the key point here is to, is to pay attention to uh, public procurement rules, if they are applicable for, to you and if they are not applicable for whatever reason, you still have to follow the sound financial management principles. So uh, really, that's, uh, that's a really important aspect and it's typically uh, a source of um, mistakes or errors or irregularities in some cases. Uh, so really uh, pay attention to that because often there is no way back. So if you if you have a doubt on the type of uh, procure procurement or the type of routes you are you are um, you are obliged to to comply with, uh, have a double check in your organization. Very often there is uh, a person or even an office dedicated to that and uh, possibly at national level or also get in touch with us, we can also give you, give you some help on that. But uh, uh, any doubt, try to, to, uh, to solve it before then uh, because later it's, it's too late so very often. Um, Partridge of cost, that's, that's category C, contract for goods, works, and service needed to carry out the proposed project. So you have like typically the travel, if you are uh, foreseen traveling uh, with your project. Uh, subsistence cost, equipment, consumable, um, and, and also supplies. So here, the typology of project in preparatory study, maybe it's a little bit less relevant compared to the previous category, but you may have cost on the purchase co uh, cost. So it's, it, it depends on how, 
how you organize your your budget. The previous one on subcontracting is more typical if you, for example, foreseen in your project to collect some data, typically or make a study to see what is the relevant uh, site for your for your project and for your for your area. Uh, so um, these are the most uh, likely as well as a, as a, as type of cost you will. Uh, eventually use. As I said here is a, is a snapshot of the table that you will find out in the system and uh, there are some columns which are not uh, applicable so um, these are basically the cost categories that are not eligible in the code so have a look at the code text uh, if you have a doubt when you are encoding uh, your, your cost category costs. Uh, so those in the middle, so financial support the country indirect costs, you see uh, they are not applicable. Um, another important point to keep in mind is the fixed fu um, founding rates so of 50%. You cannot change it. In the Excel where you encode your cost per work package, you are technically able to put another, another founding rate different than 50%. Don't do it because then there will be a a discrepancy between the, the the information you have encoded in the system and the one you have in the Excel. So the founding rate it's fifty percent and and uh, it cannot be changed for the call. So this is basically the information you will have to encode in the system, but then you have the Excel uh, table that you can download in the page uh, of the call. Uh, in the tender and portal, uh, the the tender portal, and uh, there uh, you can download it, and you have information in several several sheets. Um, so you please encode it one sheet after the other because you have sometimes data transfer automatic from one uh, uh, from the from one sheet to the uh, to the following one, and then uh, there you can basically insert your cost per work package and per applicant. You can, of course, uh, have several applicants per work package. So you simply add a line uh, for, for what is uh, relevant. So if it is only one applicant, so mono beneficiary, as we call it, uh, then it's, it's, it's easy. But if you have more than one, <clears throat> uh, so it's a consortium, and the consortium is allowed, in the call, uh, so uh, you can uh, um, uh, you can apply with a consortium sort of a structure, um, and in that case you can uh, add a line uh, each line per, per per applicant, and you will report then in that table the work package, um, the, the the budget allocated to that given applicant on a given work package. Um, and then the system calculates the total. So, in the in the in the Excel, you will see something like that. So these are snapshots of the single Excel. In the first sheet, you will have simply to encode uh, a couple of basic data information like project number and the acronym. And then you go to to the second sheet, and then you uh, there you have the work package uh, name. You indicate the pro work package name and the funding rate. Again, technically you could put 30% or 40%. You should not do it, just put directly 50%. Otherwise we'll have some work during the GAP agreement, grant agreement preparation to change that one. So um, you indicate the 50% and then you go to the next sheet. So number three, uh, where you indicate the participants, which can be um, of several typology and uh, Nadine uh, Kopietz will uh, uh, we'll explain that one uh, in the in the legal presentation. So about, uh, for example, the difference uh, what, what are affiliated uh, entities or or what is uh, actually the the, the actual uh, beneficiary. Um, so this let's put it aside for a moment, and and then you have the work package uh, per uh, well, the table for for the work package, and there uh, you have columns are associated to reporting uh, periods so um, the reporting periods uh, um, will be one or several several depending on the duration expected duration of your project 
And then in the final sheet, it's, it's basically a verification sheet where you have to encode the value from the e grants, from the, what, what is automatically calculated in e grants thanks to the encoded uh, uh, data that you have encoded in per, per cost category. And uh, you will, it will automatically co um, calculate uh, your, the, 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 the budget indicating the Excel sheet. If they two coincide, well, that's fine, that's good. Uh, there's no inconsistency. Uh, and you are all set. If there is a difference, we will have to have a look what is the source of the potential mistake. Um, so that's basically it on what you have to encode in the, in, the two, in, the, in the two ways. So first in the system directly in the, in the grant, in the portal, and in the Excel, once you are done, you upload the Excel, uh, the Excel uh, sheet when it's done. One point you will see it when you look at the, when you work at in the system in the in the Excel, there are gray uh, cells and white cells. The gray cells they are all automatically filled in, and the white cells is where you have to encode uh, the information. So some point of attention, as I said, uh, there is some verification of coherence between the various tables, so the totals must match. So of course the total of the cost categories you have indicated in the system should match the total per work package. And uh, therefore uh, have a look if there are, if there are uh, incoherencies because if there are incoherencies and you upload the way it is, there are no, there are no validation rules so the system doesn't block you. Uh, but the structured data encoded in the system will prevail. So we will take into account the information that is in the structured data in the system and not the one in the, in the Excel. Um, then plan in, uh, well in advance and uh, especially for your accounting. Also because we are talking about projects that are fairly short, so you will uh, run up to 24 months and you'll see 24 months goes really quick. And in some cases your project might, be, uh, might last only one uh, year, so 12 months. So be ready with the accounting already uh, and, uh, and have a traceable, a traceable system so that you don't have uh, any trouble in getting the, the cost reimbursed uh, later on. That's basically it on the budget. So it's a fairly simple budget, but if you have questions, uh, don't hesitate to keep using Slido at Ceph Energy CBRS and we will take it uh, later on. Um, but uh, first we can, uh, well, the, you still have the, the, the coordinates, uh, our, 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 our um, contact, and then now we can have a look at the, at the portal and uh, see how it looks like for those of you not being familiar with the system. It's the same system used in many other EU programs. For example, if you have been working in Horizon, uh, that's the same portal. Uh, Ceph as well, uh, so our, our colleagues in electricity and gas on the PCI side are using the same portal, so if you're used to that, you will see there's no, no real novelty, so you will be very used to the, to the system. And uh, so we'll go through live, um, through a little demo, Christina, our colleague, will guide you through, and then we'll have a look at the, if I am selecting how does it look like the grant agreement, what are the key article to keep in mind, what will be the duties, the obligation, but the opportunity as well. Uh, so for uh, cherry on the cake. So Christina, the uh, floor is over to you. Thank you. Um, so here we are at the um, uh, funding and tender opportunities portal, Sedia. This is where we have all the uh, grants and procurement nowadays for the, for the European uh, uh, funding. So if you have had any pro, pro project funding from, uh, from the European Commission, you are already familiar with this system. So you're looking for the, uh, the call, the CEF22 prep studies. You see here the, all the information of the call. Um, we have the frequently asked questions here on the call page as well. Um, you may have to search with keywords or you can go through the support here if you have a more detailed question that you don't find a, an answer in here. We're also going to put in the questions that were not here uh, asked today 
uh, into the into the same place. You will have here uh, places where you can get support, uh, or links to the FAQs, the IT help desk, if you have any IT uh, issues. And what is also here is is all the templates, so basically the call documents that includes all the uh, the basic information about the call. And you have uh, then specific links to the different parts. You have all the templates here, but these are the templates for information. So uh, when you're kind of thinking about your proposal, this is a good place to, to take a look, uh, the work program self-regulation. But when you're actually going to put in the, um, the proposal, it's better to use the templates that are in the portal. So how do you start a submission? So in the same page, you just go down. Um, oh, there's also a... Um, search for partners in here. So if you are looking for partners for this particular call, you can use this feature of the, uh, of the portal. So how do we do this? Uh, you basically click here to, to, to start submission. Easy enough. Confirm. And I'm going to jump into a different... Uh, this is where you end up. Um, this is the, uh, the, the, the portal to put in an application. And as I said, here you have the... Um, Part B templates, uh, the good versions and that you can use, the, the budget applicator, the templates for the, for the Part B, uh, the detailed budget table, letter of support, uh, and, and the Gantt chart. If you already have a PIC, uh, a, a system name, registration in the system, if you already have a proposal um, in the system, then you should be registered in our system, even if that was for a, for a different uh, call. So you can search it by name or you can search it by the number. Or if you don't, if you're not registered yet, you can, of course, uh, register. But here, for example, we're just using a test, uh, test proposal. So let's say we, we search for our name, we found it. Who am I? I'm the main contact putting in test, you write in a short summary of, uh, you can always go back to these things, so not to worry, confidentiality, okay. And then you have, again, you can, at this stage, you can add affiliated entities, you can add partners, you can add associated partners, the same thing. So either searching or um, creating um, creating uh, the the identity. Next is the actual proposal. So here you have edit forms is the part A as we call it, the main structured information of the proposal. Takes a little bit to come up. Um, you have general information, participants, budget, and other questions. So not very complicated. You, uh, you have the acronym. You can put in the duration of the proposal. You can use some free keywords. These are uh, very handy for us uh, for later on as well. Da, 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 da. It asks you if, it, uh, if you've uh, uh, um, applied to a similar funding before. There's some questions about declarations. Um, participants and contacts is where you put in more information about the participants, contact information and, and such. Budget, uh, what uh, Gianluca was already showing. This is the first, that long budget table. And this is where you fill in. It looks a bit scary, but it's not that bad. So you have, of course, more rows if you added more, more participants. Other questions. So very simply, uh, if you can put in here, if you have complementarities to other proposals, synergies, or and of course, in which member states is the project going to be implemented. Uh, very handy here is to validate the form. So it'll tell you if you have uh, things missing which you which will block your submission. So then it'll be red or if it's showing a yellow warning, 
It means that it's something that's not going to block your submission, but something that you should have in there. So not very complicated. And then the other parts that you should upload here are the part B, and that's the Word document, the long explanation of your, of your project, the detailed budget table, the annual activity reports already described, the Gantt chart, letter of agreement. Here you can always see what format you, can, uh, you should upload the, the document and what size it allows you to put in. So we know the maximum number of pages here is 120. These are all blocking, so you have to upload a document to all of these. Once you're done, you validate again. That's a good test to see if, uh, if everything looks fine. And submit. You can submit at any time. And then you can you'll get a, you get that email saying that you have submitted through which you have uh, access to uh, keep on editing your proposal and it's good to submit already early on so that you don't wait until the last minute just before the deadline just in case the IT system might be a little bit blocked or something to submit you can always reopen that's that's not a problem um, that's about it from this. Thank you, thank you, Christina. Um, so it's 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 a fairly easy application form, as you've seen. Uh, so we hope you will not have trouble to to um, to implement or to to uh, encode all your information in the system. Uh, but in case you struggle with anything, again, a functional mailbox is there to answer to to any question. Give you assistance there. Uh, I'll now uh, get to the last part, also the last presentation, but not least, very, very important, especially in case you are selected, because then it will be really the basis of your relationship between uh, between uh, CINEA, the Commission, and, and, and yourself, so the grant agreement. Uh, there are important aspects to keep in mind, even when you, when you uh, are at this stage, because it's important to know uh, what happens next if you are selected and we hope you will be selected and we'll see uh, plenty of good proposals so I see Nadine Kopietz from the legal uh, uh, unit in Sinea already uh, connected there so uh, I hand it over to you Nadine to guide us through the legal aspects thank you thank you Gianluca I'm waiting for my slide to come up yes. Thank you. So um, my name is Nadine Kopitz. I work as a legal advisor for CINEA and I will talk about some um, legal provisions you should be aware about, as Gianluca said already now. Because when your project is successful and you are um, awarded a grant, you will have to sign with us, with the agency, the granting authority, a grant agreement. And I would like to walk you through uh, some provisions of it and also explain what it is already. You heard this morning already grant agreement quite some often, but basically um, it is a contract between CINEA and you, the beneficiaries, and it will um, it regulates your rights, your obligation, and also how much money you might receive, you will receive from the uh, from, from us, from the agency. Your rights, please get familiar with it. It's, of course, to receive EU funding, to own the results of the projects that you have generated, but also in case of something uh, is changing during the application of your action, you have the right to ask for an amendment. But where there are rights, there are also obligations and you are obliged by the grant agreement to implement the project as described in Annex 1 of the grant agreement. You have to report to us on the progress of the, of the implementation and your, one of the obligations is also that you display the EU emblem and, and that you refer to the EU funding. As I said, and the colleagues mentioned it before as well, the amount you can receive from the agency will be set in the grant agreement. This is the maximum grant amount. It cannot go higher. But in case there are some issues, you might at the end up, at the end, um, be paid less, depending uh, 
on different factors. I will uh, come to that later on. Next slide, please. How does the um, CEF grant agreement look like? Um, you have to understand that the CEF grant agreement is fully managed uh, electronically over the portal Christina just showed you. And um, the management is means from the signature of the grant until its end, all actions are handled electronically. The grant agreement follows a corporate structure. There is a corporate model grant agreement available, and I invite you to have a look already. Christina walked you through the funding and portal, and under the templates, there was also the corporate model grant agreement, um, which you can consult there and you could have a look already. Please be aware that there are also specific annexes of the grant agreement and don't get misled by the by the by the name annex. It is equally important to the provisions in the grant agreement. And here I would like to um, highlight a few. The Article 13, it's about security, intellectual property rights, it's Article 16. Then additional communication and dissemination activities in Article 17, and the information and the member state information and durability in Article 18. Next slide, please. There are different ways to participate in the grant agreement. You could be a beneficiary, an affiliated entity, an associate partner, or a subcontractor. Let's have a look at the details of those four categories. Next slide, please. The beneficiary um, is the one who signs the grant agreement and he has all the rights and obligations. If there are several beneficiaries, it's mandatory to designate a coordinator. The beneficiaries which are not coordinator must accede to the grant by signing the accession form directly in the portal within 30 days after the entry into the force of the agreement. We recommend you to set up a consortium in case uh, there are several beneficiaries. Another way to participate are affiliated entities, and affiliated entities must all also implement the action task attributed to them in Annex 1 of the grant agreement, and they can declare the costs under the same conditions as the beneficiaries. In order to be an affiliated entity, there needs to be a link with the beneficiary. And this can be either a legal or a capital link. We will check that during the grant agreement preparation. It's important that this link exists independent from the action. Affiliated entities have to satisfy the same eligibility criteria as the beneficiary, and they should also not fall in one of the exclusion criteria. The beneficiary must ensure that all their obligations of the affiliated entities under the grant agreement are applied with. Applied with. Next slide, please. Another possibility to participate in the grant is as an associated partner, but here the big difference to the affiliated entity is that an associated partner may not charge costs to the actions and the costs for their task are not eligible and they are also not included in the estimated budget in Annex 2. The beneficiaries must ensure that the obligation listed in Article 9.1 apply also to the associated partners. And the same as affiliated entities, associated partners may be linked to the beneficiaries or to the consortium. Here at the May, the affiliated entities must be linked. Then, it was mentioned earlier today, we have subcontractors and they may as well participate in the action if necessary for the implementation. They must probably implement the action and the eligible costs of affiliated entities is the price charged to the beneficiary, sorry, of subcontractors is the price charged to the beneficiary. Usually this can contain a profit margin for the subcontractors, but not for the beneficiaries. And the costs will be included in the estimated budget in Annex 2 of the grant agreement. Next slide, please. 
So what does it mean when um, when the beneficiary subcontracts? Please be aware that subcontracts concern the implementation of the action tasks. Um, and subcontracting may cover only a limited part of the action. The beneficiary has a contractual link with the subcontractors with the object to buy something or subcontract actions. The price for the subcontracts will, de will be declared as subcontracting costs in the financial statements. The beneficiary must award the contracts and subcontracts in compliance with sound financial management. We have men mentioned this before. This means either best value for money or the lowest price, or if applicable to you, public procurement rules. And of course, absence of conflict of interests. Next slide, please. Um, there are different roles um, of the beneficiaries. I mentioned it before that if there are several beneficiaries in the grant, there should be a coordinator, and it's the coordinator's task to monitor that the action is implemented properly. The coordinator acts as the intermediary for all communications. So it is the coordinator that submits the pre-financing guarantees. It is the coordinator that requests and reviews any documents requires, required and verifies the quality and completeness of these documents. It is the role of the coordinator to submit the deliverables and reports to CINEA. And it's also the role of the coordinator to inform CINEA about the payments made. The coordinator will receive the payments and it's his obligation to distribute the payments received to the other beneficiaries without unjustified delays. The remaining beneficiaries um, are responsible to keep the information stored in the portal participant register and to keep those up to date. And they are supposed to inform CINEA and of course the other beneficiaries immediately in case there's any event or circumstance that is likely to affect um, significantly the implementation of the action. The remaining beneficiaries um, should submit to the coordinator in good time the pre-financing guarantee, the financial statement, the CFS, the contribution to the deliverables and technical reports and un uh, any other documents and information required by CINEA. Um, the beneficiaries can submit via the portal data and information related to the participation of their affiliated entities. Next slide, please. So I said it before, the, the grant agreement regulates your right, and of course you have the right to get paid, and there are different um, payments which will be made to the coordinator. I invite you to check here Article 22 of the grant agreement. Um, the first possibility is that you will receive a pre-financing. A pre-financing payment is done within 30 days upon the entry into force of the grant agreement. Uh, and also, if required, the receipt of the financial guarantee. Then there is the possibility that you will receive interim payments, and these can go up to 90% of the maximum grant amount. That means the, um, in the interim payments, you are reimbursed for eligible costs claimed for the reporting period, and these costs are subject to the approval of the, or the payment is subject to the approval of the period report. And the payment deadline for us to you is 90 days from receiving the periodic report. The payments of the balance is um, the remaining part of the eligible costs after you have received already um, um, interim payments, and um, you claim then costs for the entire implementation of the action. And also this will be paid 90 days from receiving the periodic report. Next slide, please. I mentioned already that um, um, you have reporting obligations to CINEA. Please have a look at Article 21 of the grant agreement. And the reporting periods um, 
uh, are set in the grant agreement and it depends a little bit on how long your action um, will be. So the action is your project is uh, divided into one or more reporting periods, which will serve as a basis for the reporting requirements. The language of the report is the language of the grant agreement and this is usually English. There is um, there are continuous reporting uh, requirements, and in those uh, you report on the progress of the action. That means on deliverables, milestones, etc. You do that in the portal continuous reporting tool, and there are standardized deliverables like, for example, progress reports not linked to payments, and all these must be submitted using the templates published on the portal. There are also periodic reports, uh, including the last reporting period, and they, these are to be submitted 60 days after the end of the reporting period, which again will be established in the grant agreement. And in the periodic reports, you will have to include a technical and a financial part. So these are the financial statements, explanation of how you use the resources, a certificate of financial statement, a CFS, if required. Um, please note that the member states information outlined in Annex 5, you have to provide the reports also to the member states that support the action. Next slide, please. Um, when you are implementing your action, your project, it might um, occur or there might be the need to, to, to amend. Um, the grant agreement, in case something has happened, you cannot uh, implement your action as planned. And then please be aware that an amendment must be requested. And this is done as well um, directly in the portal amendment tool. And when you do such a request, please include reasons why you think the grant agreement needs to be amended. And please support this request by appropriate supporting documents. Please be aware that an amendment request should not have the purpose or the effect of making changes which would call into question the award of the grant or breach the principle of equal treatment of applicants. So that means for us it's always very important. We always have to make an analysis when the amendment request is uh, submitted. If whatever change you request is making a change which would call into question the award of the grant. So amendments cannot uh, uh, amend the action completely. Such amendments must be signed within 45 days of receiving the request or additional information requested. And in case we disagree, um, there must be a, a formal notification within the same deadline. An amendment enters into force on the day of the signature of the receiving party and the amendment takes effect on the date of entry into force or other date specified in the amendment. Um, please be aware that the grant agreement may only be modified while it is informed and so before the payment of the balance. If a modification is requested for exceptional reasons, like for example, the change of bank account, after the completion date of the action and before the payments of the balance, such requests must be duly justified by the beneficiary. Next slide, please. Um, when you have a look at Article 17 of the grant agreement, you will see that there are communication, dissemination and visibility obligations. And what is what is it actually? So we want or the beneficiary must engage in the communication and dissemination activities such as to present the project. And this includes a project summary, um, uh, a publication of the coordinator contact details, the list of participants, the European flag and funding statement and project results on the beneficiary's website or social media accounts. The public project results should be uploaded to the CEF project results platform and they will be available through the funding and tenders portal. 
visibility means that um, the European flag and the funding statement should be visible um, during the action and for the action. So whenever you 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 you, you as, as said before, you should publish that you get funded on your social media accounts or on your website. Next slide, please. Um, in case there are problems with the um, project implementation or we find uh, irregularities, there are the possibility to either suspend, terminate or to reduce the grant amount. The beneficiaries may ask for suspension of their action in exceptional circumstances that make an implementation impossible or excessively difficult. For example, in case of force majeure, if something happens that you could not have foreseen and it hinders you to uh, implement your action. Or if you, if, if there is not a possibility that the suspension would help so that you can do it at a later stage, there's also the possibility to terminate the action. And again, we need here duly justified cases. Um, what is new is that it is also via that you have to ask for a termination or a suspension as well via a request for amendment. Please have a look in Article 39 of the Model Grant Agreement. The agency may suspend, terminate the grant agreement or reduce the grant amount in case we find substantial errors, irregularities or fraud. In case there is a serious breach of obligations under the grant agreement or during its award, um, again, it's a bit repetitive here. It uh, includes the improper implementation of the action, non-compliance with the call conditions, or um, false information provided, or the failure to pr provide uh, required information at all. We, the agency has the possibility to either suspend, terminate, or reduce the grant amount. And there are also... Um, um, I mentioned it before that in case there are major delays or the objective of the action uh, is at risk to, to, to not being achieved anymore, then we also might use the opportunity to or the, the possibility to suspend, terminate or reduce the grant amount. It's always a case by case decision. And um, as soon as you have difficulties in the implementation, please contact the colleagues um, who are responsible in CINEA for your project and uh, talk with us and inform us so that we have time to think about possible solutions before going the way of suspension, termination, or reduction of the grant. Next slide. Yeah, that was it. Again, I repeat myself, please have a look at the model grant agreement. It is available to you. Familiarize yourself with the uh, terms and conditions, and good luck with your applications. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Nadine. I think that by now, Things are much more clear also on what happens next in the if if your project is selected, um, but uh, do not hesitate to to send send any any questions for Slido. Uh, there is one that is uh, related to probably also this last part. <clears throat> Can the amount of requested funding increase between submission of application and the negotiation of the grant agreement? Uh, the question is fairly straightforward, but Nadine, to you? No, it cannot. <laughs> Very short reply. Yeah. Uh, so um, I think one of the underlying questions behind that is, uh, and if not, maybe it's uh, the occasion to clarify it, is because um, we are living in times that are complicated, also looking at inflation and cost prediction and all that. So um, uh, our recommendation would be, as you cannot increase uh, the budget once your project is uh, approved, so there is no way around that, uh, keep in mind that when you set up your budget in the proposal. So if there are uh, costs that you can anticipate linked to uh, cost increase in the market, uh, provided that is clear and justified and the reason behind, um, keep it in mind and have rather 
uh, a budget that is set up accordingly. I'm not saying that you should increase artificially by a certain percent the, or your regionally thought budget, but keep in mind this uh, when, uh, when, when you are setting up um, when you're setting up your your budget in the project, uh, there are two more questions. So, what are the requirements regarding the requirement regarding to the minimum number of project members for a project? There's no requirement. You can be mono beneficiary in this call at least. Uh, so, can perfectly be, and uh, that that's perfectly fine if your project. Uh, doesn't need to have more uh, more than a beneficiary or more than so it's set up a consortium with many beneficiaries or uh, so that's that's there's no specific requirement for the project. If you, uh, on the contrary, consider that uh, that more than one organization is needed to uh, implement the preparatory study project, you can obviously have it, and there are no requirements on the other side, so you can you can set up a consortium. You want to add, Camilla? Uh, yeah, yeah, maybe just to add that it has to make sense as well. So you may choose to have only one uh, main beneficiary. Uh, as Gianluca said, so there is no, no requirement on this side and there is no maximum number of beneficiaries either. But if we see that, um, for instance, um, an entity that is already identified as included as a subcontractor and has duties and all responsibilities that that would very well fall in the position of a project partner that could be uh, basically part of the consortium. And that is something that you should justify. So it has to make sense and be justified. Thank you. Thank you, Camila. Indeed, uh, important position. So um, yeah, do not confuse subcontracting with, with partners and in case uh, there is a specific entity really that you that is gonna do the activities well uh, that that is normally the place for for beneficiary in uh, in the project um it really depends what you are gonna do so and if you need uh and and where hmm? and and where you as as coordinator or solo beneficiary for example at this stage are located uh, do you need somebody else to help you out and implement the project so um, in that case you may need a partner so another another organization as as beneficiary uh, in that case and if you don't have it and you think you need it well then in that case you use the uh, or oh, you are very welcome to use the um, the tool in the in the portal to look for partners so that's also uh, also an option um, related question is it applicable for Example, uh, if a project includes one beneficiary and one associated partner, that's uh, uh, certainly a possible setup of the um, of the project. So really no specific uh, requirement on this point. I'll come back maybe to the lateral support as well, which was uh, uh, one of the points we, we touched upon uh, on several presentations. So first of all, it's, it's not needed to have the letter of support from all member states uh, of the project, only from those where the action is implemented. If you have, from let's say for example, if there are two member states potentially involved and the action is only in one member state and that member state, it's your member state, assuming in the, in, in the easiest uh, setup with one beneficiary, then it's mandatory to have the support from your own member state but if you have also the support from second member state, the, the, the more the better. We, it, it shows basically a stronger support uh, in, in, in the mid to long run. And linked to that, the content of the, of the, of the template is standard, so um, there's no specific requirement beyond what actually is asking you on the template. But if what you indicate as a content there uh, clearly show the support uh, from, for example, the two member states in this example, and uh, to go to support in the project and go ahead in the long run uh, towards a fully fledged cooperation agreement. Should, for example, the data you are collecting uh, showing that actually is the right way to go and all that, uh, well, it is it is a very good sign that there is an opening towards a cooperation agreement, saying one, two 
or three years time, depending on the duration of a project, depending on the architecture and the setup of the whole project. So the more you can show that there is a political support, the better, because one of the important pillar of this, uh, of this uh, instrument is to promote the cooperation, certainly to promote the implementation of renewable energy project that need a cooperation agreement. Uh, uh, in place, uh, and therefore these are the important pillars. So the more you can show that you go in this direction, the better. But we know that preparatory study are very early phase. So we don't, we are not looking to see already done uh, because then you are ready for the status call rather than the preparatory study. So we are perfectly aware that uh, you might not have much detail on that, and a lot has to be defined during your project, that's perfectly fine. So take it as a little bit of a, of a, of a sort of as assistance, a little help uh, from Europe uh, to, to advance in your project. You are still in early phase. And uh, to get more data, for example, to, 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 uh, to be sure that it is the right way to go, you have, it, it is viable, and you can go ahead with your project on the technical side and or uh, use this this money uh, uh, to in advance in your cooperation. In some cases you don't know how to do it. In some cases you don't have the money to simply organize meetings and workshops and get together, have costs for travels and those these sort of basic things that sometimes makes the difference. So the preparatory study is really there to help you to advance. And in case after having heard us today. Uh, well, you actually figure it out, but now I'm really advanced. I'm ready to go for a fully fledged call for status. Well, you have only a couple of or three months to wait. So we will start uh, the new call early uh, 2023. Exact date uh, to be to be still decided, but you will not. Uh, you know, it's going to be on that uh, area, uh, and there you come directly for status. Uh, and if you are selected, then you can directly apply for works and studies. In the, at the first available call. So depending on your own evaluation on which stage you are. Um, maybe a recap while we wait maybe for a few questions if there are more, uh, but again, there, there is no relationship between the CBS and PCI. This is a typical uh, question because people do have, do have experience in some cases with PCI. There's no relationship, but they are not harming each other, so to say, so if you are applying in CBRS, you are not excluded from PCI stream, so to say. Uh, so there's no uh, exclusion from uh, from the two instruments. But of course, applying for a call or another gives uh, it gives a certain uh, burden to you because it's work. So apply to well, it makes more sense. Um, and uh, again, if you are at first stage and you are very far from the idea of or from the details of your project idea. Well, the call for preparatory study is, is for you. If you are more advanced, you have the call for, for status and works. I'm looking at colleagues, if, the, if you have anything to add, Camilla, uh, Christina, or Nadine uh, from remote. I have one. Yes, one please, one go ahead. Um, one one po point based on the experience from this year in uh, the evaluation of the preparatory studies proposals. Please uh, keep that end objective of the CBRES project in mind. So uh, while you don't need to have the cooperating countries well identified, they don't need to sign yet that they want to cooperate uh, under Renewable Energy Directive. This is the ultimate goal of the CBRES project. So you, you have the preparatory study to implement this CBRES project. So if you don't have the uh, member states cooperating on board yet, that is the uh, quite a logical um, choice to include tasks, work packages related to engagement with those potential member states that will be cooperating in your project. So um, a preparatory study that doesn't have uh, member states that will cooperate on the CBRS project uh, identified or even uh, planned to identify and engage with them uh, is, is not fully 
in line with the call text and what we are looking for. So we are um, the, the holy grail for, for this program is to have more cooperation on renewable projects between the EU member states and other countries, if, if uh, relevant. And that should be somehow always remembered by the applicants, even at this very early stage. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Camila. There's time for one more last question before lunch. And if you have others, please, please don't hesitate. Last seconds to go. Uh, so when there will be the following CBRS call, so after this call, um, so the cycle goes on uh, basically every day, every year. Um, so we will have a status call beginning of the year. So it can be probably January, between January and February. We cannot really say yet uh, the exact date, but uh, stay tuned there. And there will be information in our uh, website, um, in CINEA's website. So there is a specific page uh, of CBRS uh, um, of CBRS program. And there you have the status call uh, sub page, and there you have all the information for the upcoming call. So status call somewhere January, February. Then the whole cycle goes on. If you are selected in the in the list, in the in, let's say to join the already free project that are already in the list, there will be a, a, stat, um, a call for studies and works. And in that case, the call will be uh, around sec well second half of the year. Expect something between September to November. So, and I cannot say the exact word because they because we need to really do the whole process and the commission needs to go through the list and there is you have seen already there is quite a lot of steps around but after the call uh, for status there will be a works and study call in the second half of the year and the cycle goes on and uh, we should expect also another preparatory study call in the second half of 2023 uh, so also around september october uh, in case you have another project idea that is uh, in, in the early stage, and then you 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 can apply with the with the objective and uh, and the possibilities you have seen throughout this uh, this info day, um, and then if you are in the list, you simply apply for apply for works and studies. The regulation talks about basically the possibility to have at least once a year a status call, and then subsequently it works for studies uh, for, uh, call for studies and works. So that's more or less the planning and goes on in the next uh, every year for the next uh, few years. Um, important to keep in mind that all the PowerPoint and the recording will be in the website uh, shortly after the after today. Just give us some uh, technical time to to do that. There is, as usual, important uh, survey. Uh, you have seen the slide uh, some uh, some minutes uh, ago. Um, to uh, to feedback on the event and please do that we really really have a look at there each time at every single uh, reply because it's important to tailor to your needs especially um, when it is time for remote type of meetings where we don't see the people so we don't see if you are uh, the type of reaction so uh, really uh, this type of questionnaire are really really important uh, for us to to, to give you a product that is adapted to your need. Um, I don't see any more questions. It, uh, uh, last but not least, uh, I think we should thank uh, our communication team who is there in the, in the background. Without that, uh, that wouldn't be possible. And this wonder of uh, remote, uh, remote type of meetings where you are all over Europe and you reach us through Brussels. And that's 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 great, and in, and it's really improving our our life. Uh, and so we are looking forward to see you uh, in the, in the coming uh, weeks and, uh, and months for your for your project. And thanks to the team, to Camilla, to Paul, who just joined us as as trainee in the office, and Christina for for the demo, and Nadine, uh, um, who is still there probably remotely. So uh, good luck with your with your proposal and really don't hesitate to get in touch with us. We are a small team, as you see, very uh, reactive and dynamic. So and we will do whatever we can to help you to uh, submit a good proposal. Have a nice day.